Ladies and gentlemen, obviously, we are on the track and off to a roaring start for our next podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Wow, the throttle sounds pretty nice. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll fade out of that, which we're doing, doing out of a home stereo. Yep. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Henry Rollins. My name is Heidi May. And this is our next podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in to the previous ones. We have hopefully addressed all of your sound issues. Thank you so much for bringing it to our attention. If there's anything we can do to improve the quality of this podcast, please let us know by writing us at TWO1361 at AOL.com. And I would like to talk about one of the ways that you are working on yourself, Heidi, which I find fascinating. Uh, I find that fascinating. Well, the, what, that you're a Fitbitter? I love my Fitbit. Uh, folks, for those of you in the real world who don't know what a Fitbit is, is how someone can take a total and perfect accounting of their ambulatory movements when they're up and around. Heidi carries this thing around with her at all times of the day and at the end of the day or at any time of the day. It's the beauty of Fitbit. You can check in with yourself and you can see what you've been up to as far as you know, ambulating about. Can Heidi, could, do you mind pulling out your Fitbit and giving us a reading right now? Because the listeners will just be so fascinated. Sure. To know. Today I've done, so far, uh-huh. 2.40 miles. I have burned 900 calories. I have stepped 5,738 times, and I've gone up eight flights of stairs. Um, would you be okay with telling us how you do extracurricular Fitbitting to work out and get more points on the Fitbit? Well, I don't think it's very interesting. I, I, I think it's, because I'm trying to you see You make it. fun of me. I do not make fun of you, Heidi. I just see you looking down at this thing now and then. I'm like, woman, what the hell are you doing? And now I know. So would you mind telling the listeners what you do to get extra stepping points? Well, you're supposed to step at least 10,000 steps a day. Uh-huh. So... I go to the gym in the morning, I walk around here all day, and if I don't have 10,000 steps by the time I get home, I put on my iPod, yeah. stones, dolls, humble pie, etc. Uh-huh. Actually, and I, uh, Heidi, Heidi, hold on. <laughs> For you, there's really no etc. Really? The Clash, P-I-L, the Ramones. Do you want me to keep going? Yeah, it'll only take another few seconds. Oh, <laughs> You're so pretentious. I'm not, I'm you're pretentious. the only person that loves music. No, Heidi. No. You're the only one, apparently, in this building who likes rock and roll, from what I've been told. <laughs> you don't have every Who record ever made. You don't like rock and roll. Whatever, woman. No, I said anyone who calls Bubba O'Reilly Teenage Wasteland knows nothing about the Who. That's okay. all. all right. That was a couple years ago. Anyway... So I'll put on my iPod and then I dance around like Mick Jagger until I get 10,000 steps. I will not go to bed without 10,000 steps. And can you tell the dog walking story? Which one? The one where you, the dog got worn out so you had to drop <laughs> <laughs> That was, that was uh, a week and a half wh- ago. What dog have you ever seen in your life where <laughs> the, the dog is wiped out before the human is no i was wiped out i didn't get any steps in because i did pilates and i came to work and there's no steps really in pilates right so i had by the time i get home i had like nine thousand steps i need to do so i got my little dog and i walked him and he protested and he sat down and he stared at me i'm not going anymore so i had to pick him up take him home drop him off and go back out the dog protested <laughs> He was like, I'm done. I'm done. He has little, short little legs. Huh. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Do you have uh, topics for us today? I do. I'm just trying to, you know, get it together because we've had a hard week. We've had a hard week. We really have. It's like, what, Wednesday? It's Wednesday. And we're already mad at each other, carrying on. Oh, Oh, here we go. Here's the victim. And I'm not the victim. Uh, you've been a little moody, or as my British friend Cam would say, you've been a moody git. I've just been, I'm an artist. Okay. 
we, yeah, yeah. we both know that's not true. I'm a, I'm no, a, I'm a hack. But Henry, have you not been? I'm just, in I'm, I'm a under a lot mood. of pressure. Really? I have things to do. So do I. So does every oh. single person listening. I'm just wondering why the last two days have been so rough. I'm trying to do stuff. Okay, you keep saying that, but you don't tell me what. Well, I'm trying to sit at my desk and do it. I was working until like 1.30 this morning on things. I'm still not near done. Henry, yes? can I just say that sometimes when I come over here, you're actually reading comments on the Huffington Post when you're supposed to... You won't do what I need you to do because you're working at I your took desk. a break sometimes to read. I like reading comments... Because people can log on anonymously, so you know they're telling the truth. And on any issue, I, I find it fascinating to see what people say. And now and then, I will take a break from what I'm doing, and you'll hear me over here, clack, 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 hello, clack, 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 <laughs> I, you know, working away. I have, a, I have a thing I'm trying to do every day, and this week has been busy. I appreciate that, but do you have to be mean to me? Mean? When I, <laughs> I'm mean to you. Henry, yeah. even you said the other day you listened to something and you didn't want to play it because you were being mean. <laughs> Not to you. Yeah, it was me. How can I be mean to you? What do you mean? <laughs> Are you joking right now? No. Wow. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> well, I was thinking today yeah. we should talk about how you started doing spoken word. Okay. It's a pretty cool story. A, l a lot of people who check out what I do with the talking shows, as I call them, when I first heard spoken word, I was in the back of a car, I think with Michael C. Ford, the great poet, who's a really, really cool guy. Uh, he's a California writer. And I was in the back of the car with him. We're driving around. I forget who we were with. And someone says, spoken word. And I said, what the hell is that? That's what we do. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Because I'd never go see a show like that. If someone said, it's spoken word, I'm like, oh, no, no, I got to run. I, I won't have the patience to sit through it. It sounds pretentious. It just sounds like someone sitting down with an acoustic guitar and says, we're going to talk about issues for the next nine hours. And so I, I, don't, I just don't like the connotation of spoken word. It sounds a little stuffy and lectury. So I always call it a talking show. But... A lot of people think that I've just been doing these talking shows for like a few years. When the truth is, I started doing them very ambitiously in 1983. And a long time ago in Los Angeles, the, Los Angeles has changed slightly in that every third building in this town used to be a venue. And there's still a ton of clubs here and good ones too. But there was a, a time when it was very clubby and a lot, a lot of different eclectic stuff going on. It very well could be there's the same kind of thing happening, but I'm just kind of old and don't get out like I used to, whatever. I just remember when I was younger, there's just a lot of interesting things like, like poetry readings, like acoustic shows. They're just kind of more arty. There's an arty scene. It very well could be alive and well and perhaps thriving in downtown or somewhere. Anyway, about 30 or so years ago, there was a guy in Los Angeles and he's putting on these really cool shows. It's a great idea. And they actually came off really well. He would get a whole bunch of performers, like 10 or more performers. Everyone gets like 10 minutes. So the audience gets an hour and 40 and, or two hours of content. And it is Jeffrey Lee Pierce of the Gun Club, 10 minutes of his amazing journals from touring. And then it would be the Surf Punks, that great band. They'd get on stage and do some really hilarious uh, sketch and then it would be a real poet like Ivan Roth the great poet he'd get up there and read or uh, <clears throat> uh, Michael C. Ford that's where I met him there was a great actor he was in Taxi Driver he was one of the taxi drivers I think his name was Doughboy because he's in the movie for a minute he's a really good writer he was part of this it was like a gang of people that this promoter kind of worked with but how did you find out about well, it? well Dukowski for a while was doing these shows and you know 10 minutes and Dukowski you know the bass player in Black Flag he is one of the most truly cerebral and intellectual creatures I have ever met everyone is intellectual in that you think you are using your intellect to not put your hand on a hot stove 
But there's some people who really live for their thoughts, where their thoughts are their shield. They, they will fight you with their mind, not their fists. Dikowski is one of the first people I, I ever met who could upset you with his mind. He would say things and really put you off your game. Not raising his voice. He would just lay some idea on you and you're like, oh no. And your mind would just kind of turn to jello and run out of your ears. He was really uh, uh, very, very persuasive and just had these really massive ideas. And he's one of the people who taught me the power of an idea. He'd say something like, oh no, the world's coming to an end. He's like, yeah. And maybe that's what we need. Like, no, Chuck, no. Anyway, <laughs> Chuck, Chuck, Chuck had this idea at like one point. He's like, what if we just gave everyone guns and machetes and just say, hey, the cops are all gone. Just figure it out. And we'll see who like really is, you know. Did he say that at a show? No, he just like, said it one day in the van or somewhere. We were somewhere. And everyone else goes, ah, oh, Chuck, come on. And, and I sat there like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I really internalized it, and I just see this this mountain of bodies and blood. blood. Bloody massacre. Yeah, and you're thinking, well, who would survive? Would I survive? <laughs> who am I? Am I going to go out and kill a bunch of people just so I can live? What does that make me? Like, the guy would make you think. Anyway, he had these notebooks, and he would just write all this stuff, everything from lyrics to ideas to, like, tour plans. And at these shows, he would go up on stage and kind of go, hey, I'm Chuck. Talk really slow. I have this idea. And he would just go into some Orwellian Aldous Huxley doors of perception being blown off their hinges thing. And he talked for like 10 minutes and kind of gently devastate the audience. And they're like, well, later, later dates, as he would say, later dates. People are like, thank, thank you. Wow. <laughs> anyway, I would go with him. These gigs were in Hollywood. We lived at the beach. So going into Hollywood, like, we're going into town. They have hard candy and running water. I'd get in the van and just go with Chuck. Because the beach was, you know, really calm. And Hollywood is, you know, lights and lots of mo movement. So I'd go with him. And I'd watch all these poets and performance artists and people in bands. And, you know, if someone's bad, you can endure 10 minutes of bad anything. And so if someone sucks, like, okay, it's, the guy's got seven more minutes. I'll endure it. If someone's great, you just want to see him again. So you really can't lose. And you got a lot of impact in two hours. So I saw Dukowski do this a couple of times. And on the second time, or thereabouts, it was at the Lhasa Club on Hudson at Santa Monica. The club's gone now. And that's kind of what I was talking about a couple of minutes ago. Anyway, uh, the promoter guy comes up to me and he says, hey, you want to be on one of these shows? I said, what would I do? He said, oh, come on, you got a big mouth. You write some stuff. I go, well, yeah, I guess, don't we all? He said, well, I'm paying 10 bucks a person. Oh my God. I said, oh, I'm in. Because $10 in those days, you know, you take it. So I said, man, I, all of a sudden, I have lots of things to say for seven, 10 minutes. And so at some amount of days later, I'm in at the Lhasa Club. I go up and I do 10 minutes on stage. I read two things I had written. And then I told this brief story. And it, it ha happened like a few days ago at band practice. Black flag for a moment. Practice in Long Beach, California because it was an available space, but a lot of Long Beach is beautiful, but a lot of it's really tough, like scary. We found a practice room in a really tough neighborhood that I think was basically divided between two gangs, the Sons of Samoa, big Samoan mm -hmm. fellows, and some Hispanic gang, the name of which either no one told me or I'm forgetting now. And both gangs would visit our practice place because they're hearing music. You're in their neighborhood. So when they open your door and walk in, you're not going to say, hey, this is our practice place. You're in someone else's house. So you're like, hey, we're this band. And, and these guys would sit with us and go, like, yeah, you guys are pretty crazy, man. And you're like, yeah. Wait, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. If you guys were in Hermosa, yeah. why were you driving to Long Beach? It very well could be. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly forgetting. We didn't have this place for very long. It was like six month, six month lease maybe. We had it for a little while, like 82 going into 83. And then we came, we found a place in Redondo near Lawndale. But, but for a minute there, we were in Long Beach. It just could have been a, insane. a really good deal. But that also said a lot about Black Flag. We didn't always have logistics great. Like that's a long drive. Yeah, but it's where we're practicing. 
okay. And, you know, I would go. I'm not the one making the decisions. Anyway, um, the story I told on stage, my first ever spoken word show, Greg Ginn left band practice to go to the local liquor store to get some orange juice. The local white power faction, and I don't know which gang this was or who, but some white power enthusiasts found out that we were practicing there and that non-white people, the gangs, were hanging out with us. And they, they would come in and like kind of trip on us for a while and walk out. They were angry that we were hanging out with non-white people. And so poor Greg is walking to the liquor store. This white supremacist fellow drives his car at Greg, trying to run him down. Greg, you know, thankfully, he's fast on his feet. He goes barreling up a lawn, and the car goes ripping by. But how do you know he would, they were after him for that? Because they were yelling. Oh. Uh, something lover. Wow. <laughs> really intense. Like, this is scary stuff. And it's awful to tell it's the story. It's weird that that even exists. Yeah, it's sad. And as, as crazy as that is... In the world of Black Flag, that's just last Tuesday. I mean, in those days, that was just, you'd be like, oh, that's awful. But it wasn't like, oh, no. You're like, yeah, well, and that was just kind of our lives were like really kind of bad things happening fairly regularly. It's crazy. So I told that story, and the audience's response was kind of like yours. Like, are you kidding me? And I went, well, see ya. And I walked off stage, and everyone said, no, no, do more, do more. I said, nah, I got, you know, time's up. And so people came up to me after the show and they said, that was really great. When, when's your next show? And I thought they meant a black flag show because I figured I'm never doing that again. And they go, you're no, you're the next show where you just talk. I went, oh, that, I'm never doing that again. Now, you know, I just got this $10 bill. And they go, no, you got to do more of those. And the promoter came up to me and said, that was really good. You want to be on another one of these? I'm like, are you paying? You know, I'll give you 20 bucks this time. I'm like, oh, I'm in. And so we find that I kind of sort of have a knack for I can survive on stage without a band. Did you enjoy it instantly? Amazing. Mm. Loved it. Loved it immediately. Um, I, liked, I liked being in a band, but immediately one felt far more natural than the other. And it was the talking show. I was like, wow, that just is like taking a fish and dropping it into water. Like, look how well it swims. Like, well, that's what it's supposed to do. And so the talking shows felt immediately good to go. So I start opening for this. This guy had poets in his stable. So you'll do 15 minutes in front of these two poets. Okay. And then, you know, a week later or two weeks later or three gigs later, I'm the middle slot. There's someone opening for me. And then after a while, I'm the headliner. But you never consider yourself a poet. No, I'm just some guy writing. I mean, I, I, to, I would be loath to insult real writers, real poets, real actors, real musicians by calling myself any one of those. Just because I got too much respect for someone who really can write. You know, like when you call yourself a writer, now all of a sudden you're trading uh, sword moves with Mark Twain. And I'm just not going there. So I'm just a guy who writes. But I, I was able to pull these shows off on stage to where people liked it. And I liked being there and I liked that they liked me and it was great. And so that's like 83 turning into 84. I started 213, the publishing company, so I could write release my little writing and that started to do really well and then i got a p.o box which we visited the other day when we went down to the beach on my birthday p.o box 2461 it now has an asbestos warning has an asbestos warning <laughs> on the front so you can get that mesothelioma that you need and so one the the talking shows take took off very quickly and i started getting interviewed in magazines about it like hey you did this i was in the la weekly now and then and promoters start calling SST. Hey, Henry does these other shows. Can we get one? And by uh -oh. yeah, and so it started causing a bit of tension with some of the people in the band. Like, are you in a band or are you solo guy? And I said, I'm, I'm just doing these shows now and then. It's not like I'm we're canceling a Black Flag show for me to do this show. We're off the road. I'm, we're home. I'm doing this thing down the street like Dukowski did. And I was really enjoying it. Were they okay with Dukowski doing it? He was no longer in the band. 
So oh. that uh, they said, well, you know, he's not. I'm like, really? And what was really fun for me was I'm meeting people I don't know if I ever would have met otherwise. Like now I'm hanging out and, and doing shows with Exine Cervenka. I'm meeting these interesting writers who are, some of them are older than me. They have amazing stories. I'm learning things. I'm being cultured a different way. Hey, Henry, ever heard of this guy? Ever read this book? I'm like, no. And when you're young, you're like a sponge, you know, and this kind of input from this eclectic group of people who liked me, it was really fun. And a friendlier atmosphere, oh, I'm sure. The gigs were way different than Black Flag shows, where a Black Flag gig is like going to be a street fight with a snare beat behind it, <laughs> where the talking shows, and you kind of got ready, like, okay, we're in New York. I hope I get two songs done before I get knocked out. Where the talking shows are like, you know, clap, 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 very gentle, very nice, and some nice person comes up to you afterwards. I love that thing you wrote. It made me think of when I was young. You're like, okay. It's, <laughs> That's cool. It's, it's different than, I hate your new music. You suck. <laughs> <laughs> and so a whole new world is being shown to me, and that was the funnest part of it. It was like, wow, there's so much more to be had. Not that music was some kind of straitjacket. I just realized you can do the music till you're blue in the face. And also, if you're willing to not sleep more, you there's a whole there's more worlds to be involved in. And so it helped me as a lyric writer. Because I'm now I'm writing all the time. I'm writing every day. And it was a new discipline for me. Like today I write. And over the weekends I'm writing, I'm writing, I'm writing. Is that when you started keeping a journal or were you already keeping a journal? I started keeping the journal in eighty two. A little bit in eighty one, more in eighty two more into it in 83 and then 80 from the beginning of 83 to right now sitting here like pretty full on but did that help you with your journal writing did it inspire you to write more yeah um i asked ray pettibone you know i don't ask people for advice i just go out and get it wrong and find out what not to do the next time but i was living at the Ginn's house and I'm sitting with Ray in the evenings, you know, band practice is over. Ray is sitting there making one drawing after another, just like just cranking him out. And I'm sitting on the couch next to him writing, trying to write my feeble efforts. And uh, I said, you have any advice for me? Like, you know, I'm trying to do all this stuff and you have anything to tell me? And he said, just write more, just write. And that's about all he said, you know, in classic Ray, Pettibonese, just just uh, do more writing. <laughs> I said, so I should just write, yeah, right, and then you know, write more, which is good advice. Actually. It really is. It really is. And people ask me, like, well, I'm a young writer. What would you recommend? I just say, write about everything, write about nothing. They're like, what if I'm bored? Then write about that. I have writer's block. No, you don't. You don't really. Um, just write about having writer's block. Watch, words will come out. Just write, I have writer's block 20 times. Just get the pen moving across the paper or your fingers on the keyboard. And so I, these, hanging out with these poets and these writers got me really inspired to, to write. And it made me read literature differently. I, I was always a fan of like books, of course. But when you read Henry Miller, when you yourself are trying to write, it's not obviously you're not competing against Henry Miller. But you look at sentence structure differently. I'm, 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 I'm only talking from my own experience. I started looking at sentence structure. Like, why did that paragraph knock me out? What was the parts of it that were powerful? Oh, look at how he uses verbs. Look at how he sets up a character. And you start looking at the structure of writing. You have to remember, I didn't learn any of this in high school. We learned, here's your grammar, get out of my classroom. It was very perfunctory. As far as anything creative, you were kind of on your own. And so I was trying to learn to find my own voice as a writer by reading and listening, going to shows. I met Lydia Lunch, who was very profoundly inspiring to me because she believed in me. One time she, she wrote me this note. I still have it somewhere. She said, Rollins, you know you got it. Now what are you going to do with it? I like that. I still have it. I'll show it to you later. And that was very inspiring. She's in New York. She was in New York. So how'd you meet her? She was in LA doing shows. Um, that's, a, that's a fun story. And, I, and I'm sure she'd love me to tell it. Exine contacted me and said, hey, Lydia Lunch is in town because they had just done that Adulterers Anonymous book together. They're friends. 
She's going to be beyond Baroque. You should not miss her. She's really good. I said, okay. So I somehow got my no car ass to beyond Baroque. Saw Lydia. It's one of the best things I've ever seen. Came out there. Do? No notes. Talked at a mile a minute for like 20 minutes. She was stunning. And everything was like a catchphrase into this. And, and then she goes, all right, thanks. Good night. Or she didn't even say thanks. And everyone starts clapping. She says, oh, come on, don't. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just this tour de force of like attitude, skill, memory. I mean, she was a knockout. And my phone, well, the Gin's phone rang the next day. She got my number for Maxine. Hey, this is Lydia Lunch. You were at my show last night. I said, yeah, you were great. She goes, here's, here's the address. I'm staying in Hollywood. Come and visit me. I said, when? She goes, now. And I had to figure out three, two or three buses from the beach to Hollywood. I said, okay. Because, you know, the band was down for a minute. I said, well, I got 48 hours. I'll just go slum it in Hollywood. So I meet up with Lydia at this place she's staying at on Gardner off Melrose. Near all the cool stores, vinyl fetish and all that, which was fun to be able to go into a good record store. She meets me, we talk, she cooks me dinner. And she goes, you look like, you. she's totally playing off like me, me being some meathead guy. She goes, you look really tired. I'm like, well, you know, I'm always tired. You look like you work really hard. Well, I don't like to say anything. But, uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, and I'm, I'm 22. I'm completely going for it. And she goes, well, here, I'll... I'll yeah, you need a back room. I'm like, oh, yes, I do. And so I'm face down <laughs> on some bed she's living in. And, and I, I feel something moving. <laughs> I look up and she's removed all of her clothes. And she's, all right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Your face is beat red right it's now. It's just funny. It's the liar video all over again. It's just, it's hilarious. <laughs> and... um. You know, it's not like one of, I'm not talking out of class because after, you know, a while later where we reemerge in the living room and like someone comes over and she goes, yeah, this is Henry Rollins. I just, neet, 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 neet. and I'm like, yeah, well, great. No secrets here. And that was kind of Lydia, like half truck driver, half, <laughs> you know. Well, she's a very talented person. Yeah, she, got, she's a, she has a, a very strong mind. In that she's another person who li lives intellectually. She lives for her ideas. Anyway, all of these associations I'm making, this this uh, fun I'm having doing the talking shows, it starts to create a bit of tension in the band. And then by 85, I had done a cross-country spoken word tour. After the Loose Nut tour ended, I turned right around and went back out uh, renting the Black Flag van from Black Flag. In the band, were they confronting you about it? Was anything being no, said? It was only, or was it like a passive aggressive thing? It was thing? only one guy in the band. Okay. The rest of the band didn't care because right? it, it didn't get in the way of Black Flag. No, it could actually end up helping it, right? Well, I mean, we in got one more, way. We got more press. Right. And so one guy in the band, who shall remain nameless, got a, it really bugged him. And finally I said, what is it, man? And he told me what it was. And so the, the it, uh, like what is it, is you should not do anything but the band. I'm like, really? That's just, I don't get that. Didn't you pass up movie roles I was, for the same reason? I was asked to be in suburbia, but we were busy making Damaged. And it took years for Penelope Spheris to not be mad at me. And I, I'd see her around. I'm like, you know, hey, Penelope, hello. And like one day... But why didn't you do Suburbia? Oh, we were busy. I mean, we were about to go you on tour. You couldn't have done both? No. We, we were making Did you want to do it? No, I didn't really think about it. I mean, I was just like, we're so busy. And all of a sudden, this offer comes in. I'm like, I'm an actor? I, I, I'm trying to tread water in this band. But she said, how come you didn't do my movie? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on a minute. I, I, I mean no disrespect. I was, we were making the record. And, and now we're, we're pals. But for a few years, I, I asked Modi, our old pal. I go, what's her problem? With me, she's like, oh, you weren't in suburbia. She just goes mad about it. She really wanted you in the movie. And then um, she said, yeah, I'm mad at Henry because he wasn't in my punk rock movie. I said, well, sorry. Anyway, we're cool now. We've been cool for 100 years. Anyway, by 85, I did this tour. That did pretty well. You know, sleeping on a lot of promoters' couches after the show. 
by 86, I'm now writing for Spin Magazine, and I have multiple paperback books out that didn't, are doing very well. Didn't you write for Details? Wrote for Details later. Oh. Uh, that came later. That was Rollins' band era. Spin Magazine was during Black Flag, and we walked, we drove by the 7-Eleven the other day in, by the beach, where I said I walked to that 7-Eleven to buy a cup of coffee with all the money I had, thinking, what am I going to write for Spin? And I said, I'm going to write it about 7-Eleven. Well, you and I drove by that 7-Eleven on our way to the beach the other day. Didn't the cop stop you on the way to that 7-Eleven? Stopped me on the way to the 7-Eleven and said, where are you going? I said, right to that 7-Eleven right there. You been fighting tonight? I said, no, sir. Well, you look like you've been dragged through a knot hole. <laughs> and I have to figure out what, what that means. I guess I looked bedraggled in, with my duct tape belt and... uh I had found a pair of Earth shoes. Do you remember Earth oh. shoes? So there I am in, in, a, in a Mr. Ginn special pair of cut off 70s slacks. <laughs> like these you know, striped tube sock socks, <laughs> Earth shoes. <laughs> and I think I had a Meat Puppets tie dyed t shirt on with long hair. Where'd you get the Earth shoes? It's someone gave them to me. I needed shoes. I wore them until they wore out. <laughs> Yeah. So ugly. It just, but you know what? They fit. <laughs> and, you know, I was grateful, but I looked like, what are you? And they put your feet at that weird angle. Yeah. So you're kind of always walking, walking up something. <laughs> I looked like a homeless guy. He like got the shoes from this place, a shirt from that guy. And the cops, you know, he said he wanted to hassle me. And I'm, you know, real polite and just want to get out of there. And he said, where are you going there? What have you been doing? Nothing. Where are you going? Right over there. And he said, okay. Did they know who you were? Yeah. Okay. That, that one cop used to stop me once or twice a week and pretend he didn't recognize me. I'd be walking to band practice from the Gins car, and you can always tell the cop car because that engine, that high-pitched, finely-tuned engine, you're like, oh, cop car. I've and never noticed. I, I just had enough of them like just creep behind me. Right. Like, oh, it's a cop, and you wave. Anyway... The cop came out and he would just, oh, what was it? Left hand behind your back, right hand behind your head. It's like Simon Says. You're like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh. And you put your one hand behind your head, one hand behind your back. And I'm forgetting which he grabbed one index finger of one of the hands and would bend it backwards. Like you, he's trying to break your finger off. And so the only way to, to try and get him to stop, you have to bend with him. So now you're doing this weird back bend where he has all your leverage with one index finger. And he would, he would uh, let me up and go, what's in your bag? And in those days, like, what's in my bag? Lyrics and an apple. I, you know, that's all I had. He's like, looks in there. And one day I had a lead pipe in there because the next morning I had to go to the construction site I was working at and break rebar. And you hacksaw a little of the, that those girder things that come out and you put the pipe over it and you snap it at the base and i was really using the lead pipe and he said what's this for he pulls out this lead pipe and i go it's for breaking rebar and he believed me and i said it so quickly and so like like i wasn't trying to lie I'm like because I, I wasn't i was like it's for breaking rebar and he's like wow if he's lying that's a really good lie and I said, I, I'm working on a, con, on a construction site. I won't give the address away. Over there, and I was only like half a mile. And he knew what I, what I was talking about. I said, I'm working on that construction site. I'll be there tomorrow morning, like 4.30. You can check it out. I'll be using that pipe to break rebar. I just learned how to do it from Jim the Builder two days ago, which I did. And he went, okay. And then like two days later, one hand, you know, hand behind your back. And like, then he's like, we don't like your flyers on the flagpole. So I'm like, okay. We can't get them off. I'm thinking, I know, because we use wheat paste and Elmer's glue. And <laughs> it's, it's the best. It's the best. And I wanted to tell him, well, here's, sir, here's how, <laughs> here's the compound that we use. Anyway, so the talking shows got popular in that a, an audience that would show up very quickly. And by 85, I was asked to be in a European festival in Holland, the... Uh, one word poetry festival or something and so i said free ride to holland i'll go and so it's me and jeffrey lee pierce william burroughs uh all these amazing people uh 
uh, it was Gil Scott Heron was there. Muta Baruka. Uh, just really interesting people on, on this multi-day bill. And I'm hanging out with all these people. Einstein and Neubauten showed up. Uh, and I was at the same hotel with them, so that's always a blast. And so I'm now this kind of international talking show guy. And the tension with a certain member of Black Flag got more and more and more, and then the band broke up. But Do you think that had anything to do with it? No, maybe. I don't know. I Because I, it wasn't direct competition. Were you surprised when it broke up? Black when Flag? Black Flag broke up? Yeah, were you surprised? I was surprised in the way it happened. I was actually at my mama's. I was, I was, the tour was over and Greg Guinness said at the end of the tour, we are going to take a hiatus for like a year and I'm going to work at SST and make it into a bigger thing. We're like, okay. And we're all trying to figure out what the hell am I going to do? So I'm thinking, well, I guess I'll do talking shows. I, I, I had kind of didn't know what that was going to be. So I went to DC to visit Ian and be around. I was at my mom's apartment. Phone rings, and it was Greg Ginn. And I said, hey, Greg. He said, uh, I quit. <laughs> and I said, but it's your band. How can you quit? He said, I quit, and I want you to get your stuff out of my parents' house. I said, you got it, man. And I hung up the phone and just sat there like, man, wow. Reality has just dropped on my head. Like with a 10-ton anvil. And that afternoon, I wrote two songs. I wrote a song called Followed Around, and I think Hot Animal Machine Parts 1 or 2. I just hit the ground running. And by that evening, I'd written like the bass line and lyrics to two songs. And within a number of weeks, I was actually doing those songs in, in a studio. But the talking shows, I was in 87... By the end of 87, by the Christmas break, 87, I had done Holland, England, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, France, and done very well. And then the years later, all of Scandinavia, and then Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Dubai. And then I started doing USO shows. So I'm in front of soldiers, Afghanistan, they're, they're Americans. It's a, it's a captive audience, you're on a base. But there I am with just me and a microphone in Kuwait, in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, uh, wherever, Honduras. Uh, but on my own, touring, now the, it's about 19 or 20 countries and it, to do a proper world tour, like if you really wanna like hit it so it stays hit, it's about 200 shows, about nine, 10 and a half months it's gone from 50 people in folding chairs at the Lhasa club to this thing that now has multiple agents sometimes a tour bus you know it's a a, a, a crew that travels with it's had a, it's had an interesting life and it's the one thing that has been more sustainable for me than the band shows in that one day years ago I just stopped writing lyrics. Like one day, that was it. I just stopped. There's no more toothpaste in the tube. Yet with the talking shows, I'm never out of ideas in that I just don't feel like I'm really even warmed up yet. Like I, I feel no fatigue, no burnout. Like, oh, shows, I don't want to do them. I have to be careful that I don't do too many in that I would like to be on stage tonight. No problem. Do you remember thinking, hey, hey, this this could be a living, like I can take care of myself with this? No, um, it, it turned into it. But for me, especially with the Rollins Band, that's where it got became international and like 75 shows at a time, really big, because Rollins Band tours would end and I'd owe the band salary. I'm like, yeah, these guys got real world expenses. I can't not pay what I owe. They got rent. You know, their their friends are covering their rent while we're gone. So I got to pay. And so like in 87, we toured, finished the Lifetime record. The band went home. I went down to London 
and started the talking tour like the next day and ended up like five weeks later in Geneva at the end of that. And then 88, we finished a, a tour and I like four days later, you know, after this long, I'm back in Boston starting the whole thing again, using basically doing the whole another world lap that takes months. That money I'd make was paying the band back. So I'm, yeah, you know, I, I know some promoters, some venue owners are very nice. After the show's over, I'd come in with like this wad of cash from like a bunch of shows and go, hey, can you write me some checks? Because I, I don't have any checks. And they're like, yeah. I go, you know, one for Andrew, one for Chris, one for Sim, one for Tao, because I owe these guys money. And do you have any envelopes? Yes. Do you have any stamps? And like, I just, I had nothing. <laughs> you know, not, not that together. And so that's, um, that's kind of how it, it was one of those things where I wanted to be on stage, but I used it to pay back band expenses. It's how I afforded the equipment needed to start band practice up again so we could write and go on tour. Because when you go into band practice, guess what? The drummer has no drum heads and every possible string and stick is broken. You need to go to the music store and quickly rid yourself of about $300. Did you is- guys have a manager? Eventually, yes. Well, why didn't you guys have endorsements for drum heads and drumsticks? We eventually got all that, but it took a while. Okay. There, there were a couple of years where we're just kind of out in the wilderness figuring it out. And my first endorsement was a uh, Sure microphone. Um, we love Sure. We love Sure. They're great. First we're off, speaking it's a, into them right now. Yeah, uh, the SM7 makes the voice sound good. But I used to burn out a Sure not by hitting it or hurting it. I would just sweat out the diaphragm. And I had this rusty pillowcase of, of wounded Sure microphones. So I asked a buddy of mine at a music store, I said, do you know anyone at Sure? Is there any kind of discount I could get? I'm going through these things like nothing and I just can't afford it. And he goes, let me, let me call, make a call. I get this phone number for a guy I saw the other day at NAMM, a guy named Jack Contney, excellent guy. He goes, uh, Henry, I, I heard you're in need of some microphones. I explained my situation. He said, um, you should have come to me day one. Like, we would have set you up years ago. I'm like, well, I could use a couple of microphones. We'll send you 10. I'm like, well, no, no, <laughs> how about two? He's like, nah, let's, let's give you 10. Well, okay. And like two days later, bonk. And it's been, a, it's been great ever since. So? So the talking shows by starting with this one promoter said, hey, you got a big mouth. Why don't you go on stage next week for $10, $10 for 10 minutes? Has turned into this thing that has, has like hundreds of shows in several countries. It is at this point what I do on stage. I don't do music. And it's kind of sort of what I'm known for at present. And it it is some of the mail I get. People are very, very nice. And they'll, they'll be as polite as they can. Henry... Tried with the music, don't really like it that much. I mean, it's, it's good, I guess, but I really like the talking shows. The DVDs, I've watched them 50 times. And I've gotten some of the most amazing letters, like, Dear Henry, I am in Afghanistan, and me and my buddies, we love the DVDs, we laugh. Thank you so much for making them. Um, I'm in a submarine on a classified mission. If without your DVDs of the spoken word shows, I would go mental. Thank you for, you know, that. And so it's turned into this thing that can take up a year of my life at a time with touring. Yes, it does. More than that sometimes. Yeah. And it's, it, but. But it's the thing that you'll always be able to do. I don't think you'll ever get sick of it. I really don't. Well, at this point, looking at my age, and the color of my hair. Oh, God. Well, I'm not 22. I aspire to people like George Carlin. Trust me, I'm not putting myself on that level, obviously. I'm just saying, here's a guy into his 50s, into his 60s, who still has an audience, still mad, still out there like letting it rip, and still has an audience who finds him to be worthwhile to go see. This is my great hope for my future because without the audience my heart would break i mean uh, truly i i don't know what i would do without people to well you wouldn't be able to do what you do right and without the opportunity to do what i do like without being able to write the book do the show 
basically output. That's what I like to do is like, yeah. let me give you stuff. Let me make it and serve it up. And then let me go so I can go make more stuff. That's all I want to do is just like do, do, do things and then fall over. Yes, I know. And, and so the audience is the only thing that allows me to do that. And so the talking. Look at Don Rickles. He's in his 80s. Yeah. He's still out there. Yeah. I mean. You, That's going to be you. you. You could only hope, you know, you, to be that well attended to. Like the people, you know, he never doesn't sell out a show. You got to be real good. And I'm not. So I got to try real hard. I mean, Don Rickles, that guy's magic. I mean, there's nothing like him. <laughs> he's I so mean, wrong. He's so wrong, but he's so right. <laughs> so that's kind of the brief history of the talking shows. But to get them where they are now, like if any of you have ever seen me in the last couple of years, the evolution to get to that point has been many years because the early shows were me like me reading off paper, which is very static. For 10 minutes. Yeah. Well, Now, the, now the, you do three hours. Yeah, but without paper. Uh, but it used to be me with a, a, a pile of paper reading, like, here's 10 things I'm going to read. And everyone's like, yeah, great, he's reading things. And then it turned into storytelling, uh, live op-eds. And it is where it is now after hundreds of shows over literally three plus decades. It's awesome. Well, thank you. It is. And I love your fans. Yeah. No, I, You're so lucky with the fans you have. Yep. Loyal, smart. Yeah, smart, friendly, cool people. Some of them knit me scarves. I mean, like, just really cool people. When you say mean things about me back in the day, I had a machete sent to me. Thank you very little. Oh, yeah. You remember the machete. that? We still have it. You do? Yeah, it's up in the kitchen. I don't have it. It's freaking scary. Yeah, it's it was like, up, great. It's in the kitchen. I was like, why am I getting this? Yeah. That wasn't the same guy who sent the naked photos of himself to Dave, was no, it? No, that's the guy... He sent a mic stand, that guy. But that's the guy I kept his letter. It's the best letter ever. He took the Alanis Morissette song for One Hand in My Pocket. I don't know the name. I don't know the song very well. But he changed all the lyrics, and it was filthy, dirty, like porn. But the, my favorite part, it said, Dear Henry Rollins, and then it was just filth to Alanis Morissette's song. And then the bottom, it said, CC, Sheryl Crow. I right. kept that one <laughs> because that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that is so odd. I don't know what ever happened to that guy. But um, yes, you have wonderful fans and you have an excellent career because of them. Yeah, true. Yeah. I owe them everything. That's why I don't take credit for stuff. Like, oh, that's what I'm like, no, no. You're the only reason I'm getting to do this. Yeah, that's well, it. it's true. And thankfully, almost every performer type who didn't have major life issues that took that it's consumed them understands the uh importance of their audience you'll meet a few uh they're just they're not mad at their audience they're just having life issues that they're you know with the every oh i've been to shows where the artist is terrible really uh, no no but i'm saying they're dealing with something else they probably don't hate the audience right but you shouldn't take it out on the audience precisely but the thing that the the thing that is really nice you and i have both met famous people you know, you meet some big rockers, some big actors, whatever, in this mm -hmm. business. I've met quite a bit of both. And the thing that's really cool is some of the biggest rock stars I've met, and you know, I'm not trying to impress anyone, I've met some big ones, and some of the biggest actors I've met, and I've met some you know, big actors. They're usually the most humble, true, friendliest, and I'm loath to name drop because it's just not cool, but I have found that almost down to the last person person right the bigger they are the cooler they are they're the ones opening the door for it's you true. walking up hey henry good to meet you it is okay i mean where you're kind of taken aback kind of knocked out by like wow you're you're all right you wear it well as they say yeah i because i think they understand they know where it comes from heidi i see something in your hand what is it? Heidi's headline. Oh, let me uh, let me see if I can find. Twenty uh, one. Uh, check you out. It's twenty one. Memory. That's the <laughs> you one. know what? I think the sound effects were playing the whole time we were talking. Very yes, low, they were. Because I heard seals or something. I heard. Well, it's that <laughs> you heard the seals. I was like, where is that car alarm coming from? <laughs> okay, so let's see. Oh, that sound. This is what Heidi May does to my mind. Oh, come on. That sound <laughs> can only mean one thing. It is time again for 
Heidi's headlines. When Heidi accidentally scares Henry, turning the page over, he screams like a parrot. Ow! Ow! Stop it! Ah! See? He, he screams like a pterodactyl. See? Ow! No! No! Stop it! I love it. You are a maniac. It sounds like, that's what I picture a baby pterodactyl sounding like. If I even come in the room and you don't hear me, Henry says I'm a shape shifter. Yes. No. Sometimes you, you're you, smoke. You, sometimes you you're the that. rain. No! Ow! Ah! Ah! <laughs> Stop it! It's so fun. It's awful. It's so fun. Yesterday when I was leaving, I said, Henry was in a terrible mood Henry yesterday. was on deadline. Come on. Oh, okay. But not, not on deadline. <laughs> he, I came out of my office and said, see ya. Scared him to death, sounded like a pterodactyl, and then he was mad at me for saying see ya. I wasn't mad at you for saying see ya. Yeah, you were. Well, you were mad because oh, you got scared. I, yeah. Ah! <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Jeez. Um, get away. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> wow. And those sounds I was just making because she, she grabs me and it's like, it's... It's, it's not... a thing I like to call the hawk. Yes. It goes like this and then you grab the knee. It goes, ha ha! <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> it goes like this. <laughs> and she does this to me in public. Like we'll be somewhere. Like we gotta be straight. Like one in time, meetings. One, yeah, one time we went in we got something. We got the carpet for your office and we walk into this place. We're like, shut you shut up. I'm gonna stab you, really. I'm gonna sell you to like whatever. We're just going off. I can't wait for you to, to die so I can drink vodka and stop worrying. Then fire me. Like whatever. We're just like carrying on as we do. And we're just kind of used to being around like showbiz people, like, oh look at those two. They're a double act. And when sometimes we're just we forget and we walk into a completely normal situation and you see people like ah uh, can they can get we, freaked out can, can i help you i'm like yeah you can help me can you put this damn thing in a box and, like, and they get like really upset like uh well, well no i'm like really i bet you got some big boxes in this place remember that one guy i went up to you were being mean to me and i said i'll give you 50 dollars if you slug him yeah and remember what he said don't ask me to do that i'll do it yeah <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, and you just went up to him, like yeah, he's, yeah. And there's this we, there's this restaurant we've been to many times. This one waiter that well, he's always there. We we like him, and he always comes by. And Heidi's the uh, has the bottomless cup of iced tea. So it's like, like where do you put it, Heidi? Anyway, I'm a camel, a camel with a Fitbit, and <laughs> and every single damn time he comes by. Hey, if I gave you twenty bucks, would you? slug him and he's like he's like uh, i i don't know he just, he's just like just kind of endures us like you have been enduring this podcast thanks for listening and so we'll be back very very soon with more uh hilarity and light and levity thank you so much thank you and until next time what are you choosing what are you choosing Oh, no, come on. What is that? Uh, this is the end of something. Come on. <laughs> no. Oh, dead air, dead air. <laughs> dead air. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, finally, he pressed the right button. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are they gone? I don't know. That's where I want, I have a bong hit sample around here somewhere. Until next time.